So we started to look at, uh, you know, so while this activity is going on, we started to look at, you know, ask ourselves the question, can, what is the property of an egg? So all these platforms I mentioned you are looking at a host guest kind of a binding. You have a receptor which binds to a particular can do that is what is the property of an explosive is to explode. Now, can you gather some explosive molecule and actually cause a nano explosion? And when explosives explode, even one milligram of RDX exploding can damage your ears. That's what we were told. They, these materials need to be handled very carefully, but they, don't, they are very stable material. They don't explode just like that. You have to give them a shock. Only when you give them a shock, they explode. But when they explode, they can, they are very uh, potent that way. So, the, so one of the things that we thought was, you know, if I can collect at least 20 nanograms of this explosive and cause an explosion, the energy release, can I measure it as a temperature change? Now, why, what is the advantage of doing that? It's a complete physics-based process. There is no chemistry involved now. And chemistry can fail you sometimes, but physics will never fail you. So, the, the physics is much more robust than, than chemists that way. So, the, so, we said, can you use physics now instead of uh, chemistry kind of thing? And uh, so, we started to make these tiny switches. Now, what are these switches? These, the gap between these two switches is like 20 nanometers, the gap between these two switches. When explosive molecules bind to the surface, now this gap changes. Now, you apply a potential between these two plates, and the gap being 20 nanometers, you are operating in a tunneling current regime. Depending on the distance, the current will exponentially vary when these plates come closer to each other. And when there is an explosive, when the plates come closer, huge rush of current happens, and the temperature will rise, which will actually cause a thermal shock. And that is what they call deflagration. A rapid combustion is what happens there, and which is deflagration. So we started to develop switches. These are 20 nanometer gap switches, which we fabricated uh, in, the, in our laboratory. So 20 nanometer gap. And then uh, we started to pass. These are nice switches. They actually work, uh, you know, the, you can 1,000 times, you can open and close them. As you can see, as applying voltage, the current will go and saturate here and you reverse the voltage, it comes back. Because it's actually a mechanical switch now, which you can, which you can open and close. And uh, so you, uh, for example, with, when TNT is passed, which is an explosive, and then the, the currents increase, so you do a simple experiment. You expose it to five seconds to explosive, 20 seconds, you know, uh, 40 seconds, and 60 seconds. A 60 seconds sufficient explosive comes and sits on the surface that there is a huge rush of current, and the explosion occurs, and the switch is damaged. And, uh, so this is a working switch. This is a switch after the explosion. And finally, it works repeatedly. And it's a destructive test. And the moment you, it, uh, it does it, then you won't be able to reuse it again. And this actually is working very well. So this technology now is a, is a product. So this is now launched uh, um, as, a, as a product. And this, is, this you can actually today buy. It works uh, down to 20 nanograms. Is there a way to increase the size? I can go to where? No, I can put it here. Not touch screen. Mm. Okay, let's. Yeah, it's okay. Don't worry. So, the, so we started to now market this as a product, and it actually works for multiple uh, things because, as you can see, you know, it detects all kinds of explosives. Anything that can explode, we can detect it now because we are actually measuring uh, the, the, the changes in the temperatures kind of a thing. So, so this uh, is now a, a product and uh, so this is now into the market. So though the chemistry based approaches took us a very long time and, uh, and we are still not 100% with respect to false positives, while the physics based approach worked for us, which is now currently being marketed by, by NanoSniff. It is known by the name NanoSniffer and uh, the, the patents and all that are done. And we wanted to actually use this technology to, uh, to for, the, for developing these sensor networks, like the, the sniffer dog kind of networks. And uh, you know, so we have miniaturized it. This is an IoT device. And uh, so this device, we wanted to put it in the buses and trains and everywhere where the bags are kept so that it's continuously looking for the smell, the, the, the sniffing the bags, looking at what is present inside and then you know, even the major installation. So the, the applications are, are tremendous for, for any of uh, such kind of technologies. And uh, so the, the idea is that you place these switches in a bus where the bags are kept. And when any sensor communicates to the driver that there is something suspicious in these bags, the driver can go there and look at what is present in the bags, open the bags, and do some of that. So this uh, is the idea here. 
But one of the problems we faced was, you know, this is like almost like a mobile phone. It has a transmission, it has sensors, there is a tiny pump to sample the air, it needs battery. So, and uh, by the time, if by evening, the battery is dead. So now, and you need at least a dozen sensors to monitor a complete burst because it's like a sniffer dog. Even dogs also need to go very close to the source of explosive to detect it, and it cannot be better than the dog in any way. So the, now that's a challenge. So how do you power these sensors? Now that became a big challenge. Otherwise, now you can take the power existing in the burst and connect them, but then the challenge is now you'll have to modify the, the body, and then you, uh, you know, it, it requires a lot of effort to integrate them. And if a terrorist comes and just cut the wire and place the bomb, your eight years of research will be nothing. So that, so you, that also doesn't work. And now if you say, I will have to conceal the wiring in all these 10,000 buses, nobody is going to do it for you. So, the, so we said, can we find a way for this sensor, this IoT device to generate its own power? So then we started to look at from the vibrations present in the buses and trains, our roads anyway, are Bombay roads are particularly very bad. So can you, from those vibrations, can you generate power, energy? and use that energy to continuously charge these sensors and use electronics to reduce the, the power consumption. You, you don't have to transmit every hour, you know, you only transmit when you detect an event or when something suspicious is there. So you optimize on the electronics, but you also generate whatever the tiny amount of energy you require from the, from by harvesting the mechanical vibrations. So that was the whole idea. Then we started working on the piezoelectrics from that point of view. We did a lot of work on piezoelectrics. Now we hold many patents on piezoelectrics, so we are now trying to integrate this piezoelectric technology for converting mechanical energy into electrical energy and with these sensors. So we actually developed recently, this is a very high impact factor journal where we, we have a patent on all of these materials. So this is a lead free material. Most of the piezoelectrics you see today are lead based materials. So we developed a lead free material which is as good as what is known currently to the community and all of that, but that's still an ongoing project. And uh, of late, for the past three years, at between IIT, Bombay, and Delhi, we are working on the agricultural sensors, as I mentioned uh, during my during our uh, discussion. So, the agricultural sensors I see is a very interesting area. And India, you know, the contribution of agriculture to GDP is not really growing, and it's stuck at 14 percent. Lot of water is getting wasted. Government of India has distributed these soil health cards, but farmers don't really know how to fill up all these cards and where to go for filling up all of these uh, materials like you know, available manganese, available iron, available boron. No, the, the, only the agricultural labs can do that, but that whole process is not really working very well. So we now have a project where we are looking at four different prototypes. Uh, 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 prototype one, volatile tracking, pathogen detection, moisture, pH and salinity, micro and macronutrients. So we have a major activity now to work, uh, to develop these sensors. One of the sensors for the soil moisture, the pH and salinity, that we are able to, you know, get it out into the market now. This is a, a calibration device for these low-cost sensors. And these are already in the market now. So we call them the smart systems. We started a company, Proximal Soil Sense, which is marketing this uh, currently. And it works very well with all the known expensive systems. Like I said, the IARI system for soil moisture measurement costs over two, two lakhs, and uh, that system this, this device works very well. So we have a lot of other activities for the sensors, and I'll skip okay. some of this uh, uh, active thing. Now I want to finish in five minutes. So the, then we actually have patents for all of these. And, uh, and so now with this kind of an approach, uh, you know, in the in at IIT Bombay, we started to develop multiple prototypes. And uh, this is explosive detector, soil moisture sensor, the electronic nose kind of a platform. The, the TDR based system and this company now is doing quite well. In fact, uh, the, the platforms that, I, that we developed, NanoSniff was able to commercialize and earn revenues and survive based on that in addition to uh, raising investments from the private investors. The explosive detector, they have been able to get it out into the market. The cardiac thing is taking time because they're, the working with the hospitals is not very easy in this country. That process is not very well established. So they put it in the back burner, but right now they have been able to get explosive detector into the market. Now they want to use the revenues generated from this for working on the cardiac thing. So that's the uh, that's the target right now. And uh, so this is how some of these systems have come out of our lab, and now they are into the market. And the proximal soil sense is, is doing pretty well, and uh, they are working with all of these agricultural companies now. All of them are testing their devices. They have gone through 
multiple crop cycles for uh, reliability and all of that. Now they are placing commercial orders with them. Even the Sula Vineyards is using some of uh, our sensors. And uh, there is a prototype manufacturing facility that we created for scaling up some of these activities. This was becoming a big problem otherwise. And uh, to just to conclude, I think there are problems. You know, if you think of India, all the world's problems are in India. I think if you are looking for a problem, you don't have to go to any country. You will find it in some part of our country itself. Now the question is, can we use, can, we, can these problems become opportunities for us? And uh, that is where, you know, addressing the bottom of the pyramid is very important. So we are in academic institutions, we are just following the most of the MNC products are good, but they are reaching maybe the 100 million of the 1.3 billion population. Other than the mobile phones, I don't think too many of their technologies have reached this bottom of the pyramid, but there is an opportunity there. And there the, the, the price point, cost points are very important. And uh, But our R&D in academic institutions are still driven by the North American and European model. Our choice of picking problems is still from the library. I think the first thing we do when a PhD student joins us is send that person to the library, you do a literature review. And after that, the problem starts. And by the time you complete, you write some more papers, it also goes back to library. So the, it starts with library and goes back to library. That is how 90% of our research currently is happening. So we said, can you pick up problems from the society, from, from you know, other sources, other than the library? So this is uh, what uh, we, are, we now need to do. But again, you know, we said it's a challenge to, to orient people to start picking up problems from the society. And this local R&D for product development is absolutely essential. And all those soil moisture sensors, you need to sell them at 500 rupees, 1,000 rupees. And they're developing these technologies in Stanford and marketing, you know, is not going to work here. So we need to do all of that locally to, to make them uh, affordable. And, uh, but it's possible to do high quality research in academic institutions. What is required is the, the relevance. The, the, what is required is you know, to put in place the, the proper relevance and delivery models. You know, when I call R&D, while we call it research and development, to me R&D is relevance and delivery. I think uh, the relevance of our research is very important and the delivery of what you, what you do in academic institutions to the society is another aspect where we need to work on. And there are even government of India is also pushing us now to do all of this. And creativity in higher education sector to me is as important as literacy at the grassroots level. And this is, you know, other than, uh, unless we do that, unless our students become job providers, I don't see much of a future, you know, for, for this country. And just my last slide, how do you make our institutions uh, uh, creative? To me, our institutions need to become idea factories. And idea factories will happen only when you bring unlike minds together. This is what I was mentioning. We need to bring people with different cultural backgrounds. And that is where at IIT Delhi we started lots of international programs. I want to have lots of international faculty and students come and work in our institutions. When people from different cultures come and you know, talk to each other, a lot of creativity can happen. People from different disciplinary training. Now, I, we, these are all the different things that we have done at IIT Delhi to improve this disciplinary training uh, kind of collaborations. Now, we started a new school for interdisciplinary research. We started, for example, work with AIMS, work with Oil India Institute of Ayurveda, Indian Council for Agricultural Research, National Institute of Immunology. Next week, we are calling at least 30 institutions in Delhi to IIT Delhi just to see how can we work with each other. So the, I think this is now very important for us. And also people with different attitudes. That is where working with industries is important. That is where the research parks are very important. What IIT Madras has done is now, you know, is a, is a model that we are all trying to emulate. But that is that has made a huge difference for IIT Madras. And eventually, I am sure it will make a difference to all our institutions uh, as well. And also uh, create an ecosystem for, with these processes, you become creative, work on real world problems. But we need to create an ecosystem for high tech startups. And that is where we again launched lots of uh, schemes. The FIRE is a new program. We launched a PhD incubator we started. I think uh, this is where the relevance and this is where the delivery aspects we need to strengthen. This is what we are actually trying to do and I hope you know, some of these experiments will be successful. Thank you very much. I'll stop. And I should thank uh, all these funding agencies and more importantly the students. Finally, you know, we all speak what they do. So, the, I think so the, it's all, all credit should go to the excellent students that are, who are working with us. Thanks a lot.